Well, good morning, everyone. How are we all doing today? Oh, lots of people saying good morning in the chat already. That's fantastic. Including with a Santa reaction to a good morning. That is ever so slightly surprising, but uh, but okay. Well, hi, good morning. Uh, so it's very nice to mm, see you. Have you seen me? Well, I need to figure out another way to say that. I, it's very nice to see that you are interacting with me at the very least. How about we put it that way? So I've got a question in the chat already. We haven't even started yet, but already we have a question that's fantastic. So there's a question. Does the Student Help Center help with code errors and morning? Morning. So... The Engineering One Student Success Center is there to help you understand the things that you are learning about. So when it comes to things like exercises, yes, absolutely, 100%, the Help Center tutors, sorry, the Success Center tutors can help you with absolutely anything, even down to the level of showing you, well, here's how I would solve the exercise, now you do it. When it comes to the assignments, the Help Center tutors are still going to help you understand the material, and they're going to do things like I would do if you came to my office, which, by the way, you're very welcome to do. Set up an appointment and we can find a time. You can come to my office and I will ask you questions like, okay, so what does this mean? Or what is it that you're attempting to do here? Or how, you, how do you understand this thing? And the goal is to get you to the point of being able to solve the assignment problem. Now, the tutors in the Success Center are not going to say, here's how I would do it. I would do X, Y, and Z. And then you say, thanks very much so that you can do X, Y, and Z because the assignments, you're supposed to solve the problem yourself. But in concrete terms, for example, the Help Center tutors are not going to show you code. They are not going to say, well, all you need to do is create a loop that says blah, blah, blah. But they may very well help you probe your understanding of the problem, probe your understanding of the concepts in the course, and also perhaps ask you questions that will help you realize the thing that you're not understanding. So it's kind of like a leading a horse to water but not making it drink kind of scenario. Whereas with exercises, I mean, they can go absolutely 100% to town and just show you here's how to do it. So that's kind of the distinction just because assignments are individual work. The first assignment has not been posted yet, but I do hope to get it posted eh, maybe later today, maybe this evening. We'll see. It's partly done. And I think it's going to be a good one in terms of like interesting and, and not too hard and, and all that good stuff. Uh, there's a question. When will the grade scope logbook submission open for Monday slot? Um, I think probably soon, but that is going to be a question that if it's not open for you, you can ask the lab instructor. So Ms. Hogan's email address is lehogan at mun.ca. Feel free to ask her about such things. Um, she would have the definitive answer. Okay, so today we are going to move on to talking about some new things. We are going to talk about loops. So you remember previously I said that we were going to learn about new kinds of flow control so that instead of the logical flow of our program be just do this statement then this one then this one then this one instead we're going to be able to write programs that can do more interesting things do this statement then this statement then within this if statement we're either going to do this set of things or we're going to do this set of things depending on some circumstances. So an example you might remember in the lab being doing some things that were kind of tedious and painful to have to do over and over and over again. And some students in the lab actually asked, boy, it feels like there ought to be a better way to do this, to get the computer to repeat things for us. And that is exactly the thought that we want to have. So you might remember in the lab, we did things that kind of looked like reading from the device. So we had our handy Let's see if this cable is long enough. We had our handy Grove beginner kit, and we could read something from a sensor, and then we could write information to an actuator of some kind, and then we would do that over and over and over again. So in terms of the Grove beginner kit, well, here's an even better picture. We had something that kind of looked like this. Let me put my face away. So here's the whole Grove kit, and zooming in a little bit on just element D4 which is this LED, and on element A6, which is this light sensor. Now, different people use different sensors, and that's fine. I'm going to use the example of the light sensor. So we had element D4, which is a digital port, and we had element A6, which is an analog 
port, which means that the light sensor takes electrical values anywhere between like zero and five volts on a continuous number line, as opposed to digital devices are either on or off. They're Boolean, which means we might naturally want to represent light information here, an analog sensor value, as a floating point number. Now, as it turns out, for kind of funny reasons, the Arduino sensor, and it has to do with digital or analog to digital conversion, the sensor actually records these values as an integer number rather than a floating point number. But still, we have a range of values we can get from this analog light sensor, and this LED can either just be on or off, true or false. So, if we take a look at Thony, and by the way, Thony can do something new that actually, even when I taught this course last year, Thony couldn't do. So this is kind of exciting, and in the first couple of days of the course, I didn't even know it could do this until I started exploring the new version. So in Thony, if you go to your Tools menu, you should see an option to Manage Packages. If you do that, this dialog will pop up and it'll list a bunch of different Python modules that have been pre-installed with Thony. And if you type ng1020 and press enter, you will see our ng1020 library comes up. And so actually then you can click install if you haven't installed it or upgrade, or I think this button probably says uninstall. Yeah. So you can actually install the ng1020 module in Thony which is pretty cool. That is something we haven't been able to do before. So hooray, that will make it even easier for me to demonstrate certain things to you as we do these lectures. So for example, from ng1020.arduino.api import star. Okay, very good. So I've imported all of the things that are available in this in this module called ng1020.arduino.api, and you'll see there are a bunch of things that look familiar. Some of these functions we've seen before, like analog read, analog write, buzzer frequency, digital read, digital write, and maybe some other functions that we haven't actually used yet. And in the lab, you probably did something like this. So I've got my Grove kit here, and you may have typed something like analog read. And if I wanna read from this light sensor, Mm, no, over here. If I want to read from this light sensor, which analog port is that? Well, I won't wait the five seconds of lag. I'll say it, that's analog port six. And if I type analog read, as we've seen in the lab, sometimes the first time you issue a command, it takes a little while. And then the second and the third and the fourth are much faster. So I can do this analog reading. If I bring this closer to a light that's over here, Actually, that might be just about maxed out. If I put my hand over this light sensor, you'll see I'm getting much smaller values. So in the lab, you probably did something like take that analog reading and put it in a variable. Tell the computer, the little Grove kit, store this in your memory. So we might say that that light reading, we might store it in a variable called light, for example, and then assign that to a variable. And then we probably did something like if light and different people had different conditions, but let's say if light is more than 400, then I want to turn on my LED. So I want to write to digital port four, port D four. I want to write to that digital port and send it the value true. And when I do that, it should turn on that LED. Otherwise, I want to write false. And so when I press enter here, we are going to, I'm going to hold this up and we're going to see if we can do this in live real time. And so I'm going to run this and the computer is going to go off to this value of light that's stored in memory. That's 739. It's going to compare it to 400. And what do we expect is going to happen? Well, we expect the light should turn on and it does. Hooray! So now what I'm gonna do, I'm going to cover up that light sensor so you can no longer really see, or it can't see a lot of light anymore. And now I'm going to run this code again. I'm gonna run that if statement once more. If light is greater than 400, turn the LED on, otherwise turn it off. What do we expect is going to happen? 
What should happen when I press enter and run this if statement again? Just the if statement. Someone's typing. It's going to stay on. Yeah, that's right. Why is it going to stay on? See, it did stay on. Why did that light stay on? Right, because the value of light hasn't changed. Because when we look, when our interpreter interprets this if statement, it says if light is greater than 400, okay, well, what's the value of light? The value of light is whatever is stored in the light variable in memory. We're not like automatically going back to the Grove kit and reading a new value from the light sensor. No, no, we're just taking whatever number is stored in memory, which is 739, which means that if I want to turn that sensor off, well, I can cover up that light sensor all I like, but something else I had better do is run this statement again, assign a new value to light. And now you see light goes down to 75 because I was covering up the light sensor at the time I executed that statement. And now if I run that if statement again, look at that, our light turned off. Mm -hmm. There, you can see it's off. Okay, and so in the lab, in the first lab, you may have found yourself running the same statement over and over and over, like take in a reading, turn on the buzzer frequency, turn off the buzzer. Take in a reading, turn on the buzzer frequency, turn off the buzzer. And typing these things over and over and over. At some point, you may have clued into the fact that if you press up, then Python will, the Python interpreter will go back to a previous statement. And so at least instead of typing the whole thing multiple times, you may have just pressed up a few times, pressed enter, and then pressed up a few times, pressed enter, pressed up a few times. Ugh, that's still pretty tedious though. In the most recent lab, you were probably doing something more like, writing a script. So here's a little script and I can run this script. And when I do that, it turns the light on. Ta-da, uh, there we go, there's the camera. So everything's kind of reversed in direction. Um, if I cover up the light sensor and run my script again, well, it turns the light off. Oops, sorry, <laughs> it turned on because I let go too quick because the board needed a second to reset, and then now it has stayed off. Whereas if I take my finger off the light sensor, the board needs a second to reset, and then the light turns on because there's lots of light coming in from the light sensor, a value of 742. So last week, you may have been typing things over and over and over and over again. This week, you were clicking to run the script over and over and over again, but still, having that script that we can run is still a little bit painful, isn't it? Like, it's, it's better than having to type things over and over again, or press up, up, up over and over and over again, but still, there must be a better way. And remember, the catchphrase, or one of the catchphrases that we like to use is that programmers are lazy in a good way. Programmers are lazy in the sense of we don't like to repeat ourselves. We don't like to have to type things over and over and over and over. We would rather get the computer to repeat or to follow our instructions over and over and over. It's kind of like, uh, listen carefully, I'm only gonna say this once, and then the computer just does the instructions over and over. So that it would be a better way if only we could do it. Now, let me ask you a very, very quick little question in Top Hat. Incidentally, people could type in the chat maybe where you are tuning in from. If you are tuning in from home or from somewhere on campus that is not the engineering building or from EN 2006, or from somewhere else in the engineering building that is not EN 2006. I'm just curious. You don't have to, obviously, but I'm, I'm just curious about the distribution. Okay, one in the library. Another in the library. 
Library study room, physics building, library, core science, Carboneer, 2006. All right, core science, yeah, yeah, that's where I am too. Library, library, Eastport, nice. Okay, lots of folks in the library. Uh, from the UAE, yep, that is, uh, that is probably going to win the prize for the furthest away this morning. Hopefully, travel things can be sorted out, and I know I've had several emails from students recently telling me about how they're going to arrive close to or on the day of the midterm, and we'll see what isolation is required of them and stuff. If you have travel plans and you get here and they tell you you have to isolate and therefore you can't come to the midterm, let me know because you're not going to get a zero on the midterm because of a, a mandated uh, self-isolation or quarantine requirement. We'll, we'll make sure that things get taken care of and you're accommodated one way or another. The, the most likely way is that the weight from your first midterm will just be shifted onto other things like midterm two and the final exam. But we'll see. If there's a whole bunch of people in that position, then I don't know. I, I don't really want to have to make up multiple versions of the first midterm and have to have multiple opportunities to sit for the midterm. But, well, we'll see. I'm trying to be flexible with you, and I appreciate you folks being flexible with me as well. Okay. Let's see, someone else is in Saudi Arabia. I think the UAE is just ever so slightly further. So Saudi Arabia, that's a, still a pretty good distance, but I think the prize for the furthest this morning might be for the uh, whoever said they're in the UAE. Okay, so we've got lots of answers here. And let's have a look at the responses. And yes, we are mostly, most of us have the correct answer, though not all. So remember, when we describe a condition in a flowchart, when we look at this flowchart, we've only been looking at arrows that come out of decision boxes, which are labeled yes or no. When we have been looking at if statements in the lab, in the exercises, or soon in assignment one, a condition is always something that evaluates to true or false, yes or no, which makes it a Boolean variable, or sorry, a Boolean value. Uh, so there's advice being given about immigration and, and such matters and things in the chat. And I would say that recently, like yesterday, there were changes that were announced to the provincial rules about self-isolation. And as far as I know, that includes for international travelers, but you may have, but you should always check the most up-to-date advice on the provincial government's website. And of course, the federal government is, has jurisdiction over the borders, and so they may say something different. So yes, there are now people, or as of Saturday, I think there will be people who, if you're fully vaccinated with approved Health Canada approved vaccines, you may be able to come into Newfoundland and not have to isolate. But please keep an eye on whatever the current government advice is, because, of course, I'm not an immigration advisor or lawyer, and I suspect that your classmates aren't either. But the, what someone said is true, that there was a change to the rules that was announced yesterday. So that looks positive. That said, if we have people who, for example, so some of the isolation rules say things like you don't have to self-isolate anymore, but we ask you to avoid large groups for five days or something like that. If there's somebody who's in that position, then we'll find a way to make it work for you. I know we have different sizes of rooms that people are going to write their midterm in. And so maybe we can arrange for you to be in one of the smaller rooms or even a slightly more isolated situation if you have to be. So uh, that's good. It's fantastic that we are trying to help each other out. Okay, so uh, condition evaluates to true or false. It is a Boolean value. So remember, we were talking about when we introduced if statements, we had these flow charts that allow you to trace the logic of a program through a chart. And each, and this is kind of a complicated decision that has to be made here, right? Like deciding whether somebody gets to move on to the next term or not. There's actually a lot going on and there are a lot of different possible outcomes that can happen here. However, we can boil it down to a bunch of simple 
decisions where each one has a yes or no answer. Now, I also note that this promotion process for term three, term four, term five, term six, term seven, and term eight is different from that of engineering one, but hopefully you're understanding the engineering one promotion process a little bit better thanks to exercise three. But also, this is not the whole story. So we have said that Actually, before I say that, let me move on to the next thing. So this is not the whole story about control flow, but it's also not even the whole story about engineering promotion. Here is a more realistic flow chart. So here's a flow chart that shows the entire engineering undergraduate program. So up here, there's a tiny, tiny little box, which is engineering one. And then you do term three and then you do term four, and then you do term five, and then you do term six, and then you do term seven, and then you do term eight. And after you've done term eight, finally you can graduate. And there's even an element missing in this flow chart. What's the thing that I'm not even showing at all in this flow chart about an engineering program, an engineering undergraduate program? Yeah, work term. So that's even an important element that's been left out. So this is a very, very simplified flowchart that doesn't show all of the real details and complexities of this program that you've embarked on, but it still looks kind of complicated enough, doesn't it? So that is a bigger flowchart. And what's different now, we have lots and lots of terms, but you notice that each one of these is basically the same. If I look at flowchart for term three and the flowchart for term four, I mean, they kind of look the same, don't they? Like what is different about term three versus term four between those two flowcharts? What's, what's different about these things? Do you notice any differences? Okay, so the name is one, yeah. One is called Academic Term 3. One is called Academic Term 4. Yep. Anything else? There's one other detail. It's one of the possible outcomes. Right. So one says FR3 and one says FR4. So FR3 stands for fail, repeat term three. So fail and we recommend that you go back and do term three again. Whereas FRW is fail and we recommend that you withdraw from the program. And so, you know, that doesn't happen all that often. FQW means fail and we require you to withdraw from the program and not try again for like at least two years. And that, that doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. But fail and repeat a term is something that does happen sometimes. But fail and repeat term three, fail and repeat term four, I mean, there's a sense in which they're kind of the same thing, right? They are different because one says you repeat term three and the other says you repeat term four. So they are different, but they're kind of the same thing too. So these flow charts for all these different terms, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, they're basically the same thing. There are a couple of details that are different, but they're sort of the same. So a question is, could we describe this process in a more abstract manner? What does abstraction mean? Someone asked, could you zoom out a little? Uh, well, and now I've switched away from that, that whole thing. So. so what does abstraction mean? Not necessarily even in programming in particular, just, just in general. Okay, so one way to think about abstraction is it's making things simple. Yep, and the way we make things simple is by ignoring some details. So, for example, when someone asks you, what are you doing in university? You're probably going to tell them, I'm in engineering. You're probably not going to tell them, I'm in engineering one, which is the common core first year part of all six engineering disciplines offered in the faculty of engineering and applied science, right? Or when someone asks me, which faculty am I a part of? I say engineering. 
Now, technically, it's, it's leaving out some details, right? It's the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science, but when I say engineering, everyone knows what I mean. So we can leave out certain details to make things a bit simpler. So abstraction is providing a higher level view of something that omits low level details in order to be able to think about the bigger picture. So when something is more abstract, we're thinking more big picture. When something is more concrete, we're thinking more thinking about the details. And both matter, right? The details are incredibly important, but sometimes we wanna think about the big picture. And so one of the big things that we do in programming is build abstractions. So we sort out those details. We think through the details in very, very specific ways, and we get really, really picky about the details so that we can create a higher level abstraction that lets other people ignore those details. So for example, when I interact with this Grove Beginner Kit, let's see, when I open Thani here and I type something like digital right for true, well, that's a really, really simple function. Actually, sorry, I should restart that. Digital right for true. There we go. I've turned on my little LED. That's a pretty simple abstraction, right? The idea of writing a true value or a false value to digital pin four, I mean, that, that's a pretty high level idea of, um, we're thinking in pretty abstract terms when I say just put the value true on that pin. Now, I also had to write a whole bunch of code underneath that that would take that inside of the digital write function would do things like craft a specific message to be sent over a serial port to the Grove Beginner Kit, and then I had to write other code that would run on the Grove Kit and receive that message and turn that into a different function call. There's lots and lots of detail, and all the details matter, but sometimes we wanna think more abstractly. And so we build abstractions that allow us to think more abstractly. So someone has suggested in the chat something quite accurate. We could describe this process more abstractly by having things like terms. So instead of saying, we are now going to walk through the flowchart or the process of academic term three, and you might get an FR3, instead we could say, here is the process for describing an academic term N, or an academic term T, and then you might get a result of PRP or FRW or FRQ, or you might get an FRT or an FR whatever the current academic term is. And so if we could do that, well, then we could just say and do that six times. Do that for three, four, five, and six. Uh, sorry, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you'd be done. So remember, we talked about conditional control flow initially being introduced with things like if statements. So either we do this or we do that. But I said based on a condition. So if the condition is true, we can do this. And if it's false, then we can do that. Then we added the additional little bit of complexity, which is sometimes we want to have multiple conditions. So if this condition is true, do something. Elif this condition is true, then do something else. L if this condition is true, then do something else. And we had some of those exercises last time. But previously I said that we would also introduce you to looping. Do something oh, excuse me, over and over and over again as long as a particular condition is satisfied. And so now we're gonna do that. And so here's a much more compact representation of that entire flowchart. So just remember, this was the flow chart that we had before. This was the whole thing going from engineering one up here all the way to graduation down here going through eng one and then academic terms three, four, five, six, seven, and eight all the way to graduation. Now we can represent that big complex flow chart just as this. So what is different in this flow chart representation versus what we had previously. In fact, let me pop that open in another tab. So what's different here? OK. 
Okay, so there's a loop for one thing. Yep. What else? Okay, yep. So we've got frx instead of fr3, fr4, whatever. So here we have x is a variable. What else? What else do you observe just by looking at this flowchart? Yeah, so one key element here. So we do have, oh, my cursor has disappeared. Okay, so we do have this new variable that we're creating called x, and we're storing that number three or we're storing three in it initially. Then we have our loop. We do this stuff and then we go back around again. Do some stuff and then go back around again. Every time we go back around again, we check to see is the current term greater than eight. So you do term three and then we come down here and we increment. So we take whatever it was, it was three. Three plus one is four. So now we're putting four in X, go back around. Let's do term four x becomes five, go back around to x becomes six, x becomes seven, x becomes eight, and then we do academic term eight, x now becomes nine. Ah, look at that, there is no academic term nine. We are all done, let's graduate. So those are some things that are different. So this is a more compact way of representing the same process. So we have the same process as before, but what's different? Well, now we have this more abstract description of the current term, and we also have this repeating control flow where we go through the same flow chart, the same logic, multiple times. This is a loop. And this is something that we are going to see in, and in any programming language, not just in Python. Certainly we are gonna use Python, but this is true in all kinds of programming languages, that when we have loops, we are gonna set things up. We're going to initialize the loop. In this case, we initialize the value of X. Then we are going to check a condition. And then if that condition is true, we're gonna do the stuff inside the loop and update some values that will change things for us so that the condition might ever in the future evaluate to false. So the condition is true. We go into the loop, go around, go around, go around, go around, go around. We keep doing that over and over until that condition becomes false. So in Python, the syntax for at least the first kind of loop we're going to show you is a thing called the while loop. It's called a while loop because it uses the keyword while. And it's pretty straightforward. Instead of, so previously, we might have written something that says, let's see, light equals analog read six. And then I might say, have said, if light is greater than 400 digital write for true, else digital write for false, right? Well, now instead, we are going to write a loop that says, let's see, in fact, let's do it this way. Let's have a loop just, that just loops forever. So I'll say while true. So we're going to go around and around and around as many times or until the condition becomes false. When does the condition true become false? Well, never. And so while true means let's loop forever. I will read from the analog port. Oops. Yeah. And then if the light is greater than 400, digital write for true, else digital write for false. So when I press enter here, oh dear, sorry, I went and uh, and, and did something here. Okay, let me save this as light loop.py and write it as a little script. So while true, 
line equals analog read six. And if light is greater than 400, digital write for true, else digital write for false. Okay, so now I'm going to run this script. And what we're gonna see is that, uh, let's do the debugger mode thing. So first of all, I import all that stuff. Now I'm gonna step into our loop while true. Well, true is true, so I guess we'll go into the loop. And so we will step over this value and get our analog reading, which is currently 738. And then we will run this if statement. So we'll execute this if statement. If light is greater than 400, set it to uh, digital write true. And let's just for review, step into that expression. If light is greater than 400, how do we know what light is? Do we go off and read from the light sensor again? No, we just check what value is in memory, 738. And 738 is indeed greater than 400, so this evaluates to if true. And so we do the digital write. Then we go back around the loop again. So whereas we had previously seen an if statement says if condition, do some stuff, the while loop says while condition, do some stuff. And if that condition stays true forever, then this will just keep running. And so now you'll see this light is on. And then when I cover up that sensor, the light turns off. On, off, on, off, on, off. Because this computer is now constantly responding to the new light information. We're checking, is it bright yet? Yes, it is. Turn the lights on. Is it dark? Yes, it is. I'm turn the lights back on again, or turn them off. Which I guess if you were to think of this LED as being like a light in a room, maybe it's the opposite. You'd want the light to automatically turn on when it's dark outside. But anyway, that's fine. And so we have a loop here that is going to just run forever, which means I need to stop it by clicking on this stop button. So... Okay, let me ask you a question from here. Oh, sorry, I should put, actually I'll put my face away too. Let me ask you a top hat question from this flow chart. So if we removed the x equals three from this flow chart, what would happen? So if we remove the x equals three from this flow chart, such that you skip straight into the loop body, what would happen? And sorry, this is a, a question that you can answer in Top Hat. You should have a little multiple choice thing that has popped up or that you can answer. Oh, someone had a question in the chat. Yeah, just go ahead and type questions. You don't have to, to ask first if you can answer, ask a question. Just go ahead and ask it. Some answers are coming in. That's good. All right, I'm gonna close this question out in just a second, or a few seconds, maybe in like five, four, three, two, one, and stop. And let's see what the responses were. Okay, so we had a variety of responses. And the good news is that I think you can kind of make an argument for any of these. On the one hand, you might say that it doesn't run at all because, well, we're referring to an X in here and that doesn't really make sense if there is no X. Um, another argument could be that, well, it'll run forever because if we don't have 
if the value of x is not defined, then maybe we can't really check to see if it's greater than 8. So yeah, there's a plausible answer there. Um, someone said it would run once and then stop. I think that is a less plausible answer. So if you don't have an x at all, then maybe you could say that, that it doesn't work at all because you never are able to check this condition or the whole thing just refuses to run. But to say that this will evaluate to something and it'll evaluate to yes and then the next time it'll evaluate to no i don't think that's a very plausible answer but then the other one the last one is also very plausible and you can definitely make an argument for that we can't know what would happen we we kind of need to know what x is all right so that's plausible but let me ask you something that might have a little bit more of a definitive answer now Here we go. Now I'm going to ask you, what would happen if we removed the x equals x plus 1? So we took that box out and just the arrow came out of pass and went around to that diamond decision box. What happens in that case? Um, someone's pointing out in the chat that A and D were a bit ambiguous, and yeah, that, that's a fair criticism. Um, well, that, that's a fair thing to say. I guess the question was meant to get you thinking as opposed to have a right answer, whereas this one has more of a right answer. So I see people are answering this one. Give this just another few seconds. Close this one out in five, four, three, two, one, and stop. Okay. And here, hmm, okay, that's interesting. So if we remove the x equals x plus one, and we skipped right over that, and so pass just goes back around here, what's gonna happen? Well, let's step through the execution here. So, and, and when I say execution, I mean, this isn't a Python script, but still we can look at a flowchart as representing the execution of a program. So you complete engineering one, we set X to be equal to three. We check, is X greater than eight? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the yes and the no are backwards here, aren't they? Maybe that's why somebody said it only runs once. Okay, fair enough. Meh. All right, I will go back and fix that. Um, so yeah, it would only run once and then stop. Yes, yeah, so that that's fair. I got those backwards. Alternatively, I could have said is x less than eight. Okay, so very observant. Good job. What I was trying, what I was attempting to get at here was that if this were the other way around, if x is less than eight, and this flowchart represented what actually happens in the engineering program, which is not that you finish eng1 and then immediately graduate, but you finish eng1, then two terms, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And see these kinds of, oops, I got that backwards error. These can happen to anyone, which is why it is good for people to do things like code review and check each other's work when you are, when you work for a, a real entity that writes software for a living, then there's lots of code review that happens. And you put your ego at the door because everybody makes mistakes and you let other people look at your code and figure out, oops, did you make any mistakes here? Are there any common errors? Is there a better way you could have done stuff? So... We set x to be equal 3, then we check if x is less than 8, which is what I meant to say. And then we go through term 3, and if there's no increment here, then when we come back around, x will still be what it was before. Which means you would go through a term, and 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 a term. And a, wait a minute, there's been a lot more than 6 terms. So, in that case, and I'll have to, to fix this question. <laughs> Sorry about that mistake. Um... But the idea here is that it is really easy to have, well, actually, this, this gives two lessons. I meant for there to be one lesson, and actually there's two. One lesson is that, of course, it's really easy to make a mistake such that your loop never runs at all, but we tend to notice those pretty quickly. It, it's also easy, however, to make a mistake when you are writing a program in which you don't change the values that affect the condition, and therefore your loop, your loop runs forever. 
So we go round and around and around. So here's our syntax again, while condition. So instead of if condition and a body of statements, it's while condition and a body of statements. And no, there's no while and while if and else and stuff like that. It's just while, which is a keyword, a condition, and then some statements. And just like with the condition of an if statement, the condition of a while loop is still a Boolean expression. And we need to be careful of the infinite loop. Someone said in the chat, or you could make it so we graduate straight out of eng1. And someone replied with 100%. Um, you might think you would like that, but you probably don't want to actually take responsibility for engineered systems that people's lives depend on without having been properly trained how to build them. So it might seem like a nice idea, but probably actually finishing the, uh, finishing the degree is a good idea. And definitely the professional regulator would prefer that we teach you all the stuff you need to know about, say, designing structures before we let you loose on saying whether or not structures are safe. So, um, however, nonetheless, that is quite funny, and I'm also going to click on the 100%. And we do need to be careful of that infinite loop. Now, as is the case in our Thony code that I wrote a minute ago, in order to show you how something works over and over and over again, I actually intentionally wrote an infinite loop. And that meant that I had to do something to stop the loop from running. In Thony, I clicked stop. If you are typing a program into the Python interpreter, you could press control C, which means cancel whatever I'm doing. And that's another way to break out of an infinite loop. However, in, yeah, in this case, having an infinite loop demonstrates things, but I'd probably rather have another way of making the loop stop. What's another way that I might like to make my loop stop? So I've got buttons here, right? So I've got this button down here, which is D6, right? So what could I do there? How could I change this condition so that the loop continues only as long as I am holding the button down? Okay, so there's a couple of possibilities. So someone suggested we could do an if statement. <laughs> someone said unplug it. Yeah, okay, uh, fair enough. So we could have an if statement. So for example, if, and maybe I do a digital read from port D6, that digital port, if the digital read is true, so I'm gonna press the button and that'll make a stop. And so if that's true, then I can use a special keyword called break, which, breaks out of the loop, says, dear loop, I want you to stop now. That is definitely one possibility. Right, someone else suggested, however, maybe what we can do is if digital read six, or sorry, that could be the condition of our while loop. So this says, as long as digital read six returns true, which means as long as I'm holding that button down, the loop will continue. If I want to make it so that the loop stops when I press the button instead of stops when I release the button, how do we do that? So that would mean if I want the loop to stop when I press the button, that means I want it to continue. I want the loop to go whenever the condition is that the button is not pressed. Right, so one way to do that is while not, digital read six. Some people might prefer to say, while well, digital read six is equal to false, so as long as you are not pressing the button, I am going to go with what someone suggested in the chat, which is while not digital read six. So I'm gonna run this program now. And now we've got several things that are going on. So we have, first of all, you'll notice that these lights at the bottom of the board are blinking up a storm because now, instead of just sending one message from the computer to the board, I'm sending messages over and over and over and over and over again. You'll see this light is on, and if I wanna turn it off, I can put my hand over this sensor, and whenever my hand goes over the sensor, the LED turns off. And now, when I want to stop running this thing, I can press the button here. 
and the program stopped running. Now, if I let go, cover up the sensor, it doesn't change anything. The LED stays in what, sorry, the LED stays in whatever state it was most recently in. So it's not changing anymore. And yeah, and when I also stopped the button, you could see that all of a sudden all these variables popped up because we were done with that infinite loop and now it just showed us the information that was left over from running the program, such as the last light value that it read was 48. Question asked, how often is it refreshing and checking? That's a great question. It is, um, so I don't know the exact answer. So the it is based on a pretty slow serial communication between the my computer, like my laptop and the Grove kit, 9600 baud. And we send a certain number of characters. So I could probably figure that out. Um, it's more than 10 and I think less than 100 times per second. So you could see that when I released my hand from the light sensor, the LED didn't turn on like immediately, but it was definitely within like a tenth of a second or so. There's a question, is there a way you can make it so the loop starts again when you press the button again? Yeah, so that is indeed something that actually you know what that that's a really good question i think that's a question that you should figure out so take this example that i've given you here and draw a flow chart that represents what i'm showing you right here and, and if you're watching this and saying i don't know i i feel a little confused i'm not sure what's going on here trying to translate this Python code into a flowchart will help with that process. Sometimes there's something that kind of needs to click a little bit. So if you if you sort of trust me a little bit, and if you go with me on doing these exercises, even if you don't feel like you've had that light bulb over your head aha moment yet, just go with me on this. And, and we'll, we'll get you to that point where maybe it starts to say, oh, I, I see what we're doing here. So draw a flow chart that represents this program exactly as I've written it, and then think about, okay, how could I change it so that when I press the button, it makes this loop, which shows the light and stuff, start running, or makes it stop running? So that is an excellent question. I'll give you a hint, which is that you notice how inside our body of statements for this loop, we had a statement here, we had an if statement here, and notice that we can have as many statements as we want in the body of the loop, and then, and we show that by indenting them, and within the if statement, we showed that this stuff was inside of the if statement by indenting it even more. So the hint is that you can do arbitrary levels of this. So you can have an if statement in an if statement in an if statement in an if statement. You can have a loop in a loop in a loop, or an if statement in a loop in a loop. So start by, so I want everybody to draw this flow chart. Oh, sorry, it's on that side, but I guess for you it's over here. Uh, I want everybody to draw that flow chart or draw that Python script as a flow chart. And then if you want to, for a little extra fun, think about how you could make it so that the loop will run and then not run and then run and then not run and change whenever you press the button. Okay, so that should actually be enough for today. So if there are any questions, now would be a great time to ask them. Another kind of administrative -y thing that I should tell you is if you haven't noticed and didn't notice the news item or the item in the in Brightspace, I have posted information about the midterm exams. So as we discussed many times now, the midterm exams will be in the evening. So the evening of February 15th and the evening of March 15th. And which room you are writing your exam in depends on your surname. So we've got three rooms, which will let us spread everybody out and have way fewer than 100 people writing each in each room writing the exam. I think one room might have just over 50. And I think that's the, the most crowded room. So we'll have lots and lots of opportunity for people to be nice and spread out and keep our numbers fairly low. And here's what we're going to have on those 
on the first midterm, expressions, variables, conditional control flow, and loops. And I've even posted on the documents page some old midterm exams. Now, take those with a grain of salt because every year we have a different kind of speed that we go through the course because of different circumstances that come up. I mean, we lost a lecture at the beginning of this semester. Often we'll lose lectures to snow. So sometimes we go a bit quicker or a bit slower before. So sometimes the first midterm doesn't have loops on it. Sometimes it does. So if you don't see loops on some of the midterms, don't think, oh, that's because they never do loops. And that that's not true. And the other thing is, yeah, sometimes we even do topics in slightly different orders because we look at it and say, you know what, I think we'll try doing it the other way around this year. Maybe that'll be more helpful for students. And sometimes we do that based on student feedback. So at the end of the course, when we take your feedback, whether it's a formal CEQ or an informal mechanism that we provide, the feedback that you give us about what you found helpful and what you found not helpful, we really take that on board. Like, really take it seriously and take that information and use it to improve the course. And also in the chat, uh, Ms. Hogan is asking me to remind everybody that Gradescope is open for Lab 2 submission. So you should now be able to submit to Lab 2. Okay, any other questions? I don't see any coming up. So in that case, I guess we will say goodbye for now. And I will see some of you in labs and things later. And I guess Ms. Hogan will get to see all of you in the lab. And yeah, I hope you have a very nice week. Today's Friday. Yeah, I hope you have a great weekend. <laughs> Bye.